I'm Chandra Erlinson, Director of Indigenous Relations and Community Engagement here at the museum. And I am so pleased to be with you opening this very important exhibition, Behind Racism, Challenging the Way We Think. And to open our interactive panel today with you, this program will be in English only, and a French version will be available and posted online shortly. It is our custom here at the museum to acknowledge that we are gathered on ancestral lands, on Treaty 1 territory, crossroads of the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, the Dene, the Dakota, the Red River Valley, it's the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge the Inuit in the north and the ancestral lands that they call home. And we are grateful for the water in this museum as it is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. And our hydroelectricity, it's generated by waterways in the north on Treaty 5 lands and from the Winnipeg River in Treaty 3. And we acknowledge that water is a source of all life. The museum is committed to reconciliation, which begins our acknowledgement that Canada committed genocide against Indigenous people. The Indian residential school system is a key component of this genocide. But we also acknowledge acts of genocide against thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and 2SLGBTQQIA plus people. And we will continue. We are committed to bring these stories to light in our own work here at the museum. I'd like to share the seven gifts of being that have been shared with me. These teachings are meant to show us how we can live a good life. The learnings have helped me to be a better human being, I think, and I hope that they might fill your heart in this way too. We remember that other nations have teachings that are slightly different from these ones, but in all the teachings of all the different nations, I have learned that com commonalities are our basic truths and that these commonalities interweave all natural ways of being. The first is respect, and that means that we are to honor all creation and to encourage respect for the diversity of cultures which constitute society and to accept cross-cultural differences. The next is to love. To know love is to know peace and to get along with others and work with people, to care for people, to show kindness and cooperation. Then it's truth. And to know truth is to be real, to be natural, and to have a genuine interest in caring for each other, to be loyal in our human relations with one another, recognizing the interrelatedness of all life, and to relate with one another with an ethic to sharing, to generosity, and to collective cooperation. Honesty, to have personal qualities in truthfulness, sincerity, fairness, and to act with the utmost honesty and integrity in all relationships, and to recognize the inherent authority, dignity, and freedom of oneself and of others. Then there's courage, having a strength of character that requires great inner strength and fortitude in situations that are very difficult or when you're in personal danger. Wisdom is to cherish knowledge. Wisdom is to cherish knowledge and then is to know wisdom by taking time to reflect on everything we experience in every lesson learned and to respect that knowing and that gift of vision in yourself and in others. And finally, humility. To know yourself as a sacred and equal part of all creation. To have sensitivity to others and respectful of other ways of knowing and being. It's pretty beautiful, hey? 
Those are those teachings. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Elder Sherry Kopanis. Elder Kopanis is a language and knowledge keeper. She is a respected woman, a leader. She serves so many organizations, and she's a community member who cares for many, many people. We are blessed to have her guidance here at the museum and to have her here to open this gathering today and we'd like to welcome Elder Kopanas. Ahawa dene magnetaga nijo sek sagama koe wa se asamuk digo hatik dote gabe meteo. Onigiming donji, koe we mi guach nge ket oe se maga gi pejoshka na maga waan ge nini ma chibiga gi stago ziaan oe nongum. Kae ni bike ing oe chime nui chindi ing oe kena oe nishina beg oe stago ge nui chiba mati si minanig. Ka nishina koe oe gabago se ni maanga ga gi zama oe ga gi jate zit mani tu. Ke u ina mano ngom che bi bindi get che bi uitu kaza to e no ngom ka ka uwe e shche ge ga uwe uika gigitu e ga uwe knige go uwe e tuk che me no se ga uwe sa go ge knige go che me no se to e ga che me no ga gigitu e ga che ui so kutati e ga mi e no ngom ge je bugo se ni maga uwe ge ga ma mo ni ge na na nso ge je ka ba bata ka ni get uwe ge uin uwe ten Kauin wika kita ni ka nasia nan ganis na onda tizin gemini gunan oe oe kagi ko inan oe mitchem miskike nibe miguac hapiche dina oe sugo ganin ke i ke je mino i chinding ke je joinding win oe hugi kendan ke a joi mini gunan ya. Oe tishke hat suka negen sundan makkaya wat kukumis nani gemishum sinani gawete wabunung shawunung nagabi nung kiwit nung magesh biming a king nibi kanga ya wat. Ma tishke anishina beg ganda azwe ma si gwin wat ma takkimia mige inge gamigwe chia gama nungam git naka mige zing. Ke gi noa sago en sube bish guig ma gi bitu ig oe gi gishe at zinia. Kegi noa hetuk oe chiki kenda me kegi noa ea chi jip mati ziing anin ke e ke je shawin ding ke je ui suk ta ting. Ka nishna mi ea kita vino chi minanig chi wabanda muat mi ge ui noa ma ge je ki kenda muat ka inu inin ke e na te se siu ka vino chi uk ta pishko gi inu in ge ane ke ane nungo me hetuk ga in na te ziing. O e tëshke një në të gëpë për më të zinë, dë gjë, dë gjë kë këtëve. Ke gëtë, ke gëtë, o e të uta nëngë, apë që, apë që zënë, ki i pëzë në gëtë. O e gë, ki i mazhë të të vindë, o e në shënabe. O e së gëgë 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 më të zinë, në në gënë më këtë e, dë azë o e në të zinë. O e tëshë, për bë ka që i në një mikë, ka në shënahasha, o e gë ka gë gëtë, o e, Oe te skatua i zaga ning oe kaunja me niko e ing nebe. En su gi ishe ki wabu chetu ing oe te ge ki wit nang. Oe oe wasko nenji ga nang ge ki wabu chetu ing. Oe te shke nin ga nuttu ma ge tabe no chi minani ko e ogne ni ugi ge tizi minani. Kene ge ego ga ishe ma tizi maguk. Oe su ge ma ga ishe ni gan chka muat oe ke chowa ka egan ke wi noa. Oe që ki kenda muat, oe gë nën i e, ki zhe wat të zilën. Oe gë e në ke i që i zhëpë mat të zilët. Aha, ki që mi gë që këtë në nëm, en së bebe zhë gë e kë ki gë në a, apë që e gë zhë e në më nëm, ki gë në a që zhë e në dikë. Oe të shë, gë në zha gë në ashim të nga e në vinë gë në e shë gë 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 të si, mi gë që apë që këtë në nëm. Good evening, all my relatives, all my relations. 
First and foremost, I want to um, acknowledge this tobacco that was passed to me today to come and uh, make petitions to that spiritual realm, to come and make appeasements to that spiritual realm, to that natural world, to that spiritual world. And uh, I have three Anishinaabe names. I uh, belong to the Elk Clan. I also uh, work for that good and kind-hearted lodge, the Medewin Lodge. I've gone through that lodge four times. And, and what, what we're taught in there is to be good and kind-hearted people, a good and kind-hearted human being. That's what we're taught there. And um, I uh, come from Ojibwe's of Onigaming, which is on the east side of uh, Lake of the Woods. And I want to uh, thank, thank the speaker before me for sharing those, uh, those uh, inspiring words that we all, all uh, would be good for all of us to strive to live that way each and every day. And, but for me, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, that good and kind-hearted spirit that some people call creator. And uh, just for them to come and uh, listen here and support the words and the work that's going to be shared with us about how we're to live as human beings. We're, what I know, of that good and kind-hearted spirit were to strive to be like them, to have that love, that kindness, that compassion, that generosity, all encompassing. And so I asked them to come and listen. And I ask our, I also ask our earth, our mother, I also ask her to come and listen here. And for us to remember her, to never forget everything that she gives us to sustain our life. She gives us the teachings, she gives us the food, she gives us the medicines and the water, everything that we need to sustain life. And just like our mother, she gives us that love and care, that caring, no matter what we do to her, she loves us anyways. She loves us anyways. So I acknowledge her. I ask her to come and take this tobacco. And I acknowledge those grandmothers and grandfathers that sit at the four winds, the east, the south, the west, the north, the sky, the earth, and the water realm, that they come and take this tobacco and support the work that you're all doing here, each and every one of you in the panel that's going to be here. And I also acknowledge um, the original people of this part of the land, that uh, I thank them for allowing us all to be here, welcoming us all to be here. And then I, I uh, said that all of us as human beings, no matter where we come from, we all were asked is to, to live that love, kindness, compassion, gratitude, generosity each and every day. And if we really lived like that, our children would learn that. And our children are not like us as adults. Them, they love each other no matter what, no matter what. And if we continue to nurture and support that, then we would probably wouldn't need to have events like this. We could just live it natural each and every day, normal, normal every day. So I want to speak for our children, our women, our men, our older people, all of creation to support the work that you're all doing here today, that we remember who we are as human beings. All of us are human beings, even if we live different ways. And that's what makes us uh, special and how we embrace that specialness. Each and every one of us is beautiful and special in our own way, every one of us. So just giving gratitude for that. And I want to acknowledge each and every one of you for bringing your love, your kindness, your compassion, your gratitude tonight. That's why you're all here, each and every one of you. I want to acknowledge that. And the faiths that you have, the faith that you have, and continue to have that faith that, uh, you know, that we remember who we are as human beings and that we live with one another 
in a holistic, well, wellness way with our spirit, our heart, our mind, and our body. So thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak here for a few minutes and to, uh, to uh, ask that spiritual uh, realm to help us uh, do the work that we need to do and support us in the work that we all, all of us, each and every one of us, uh, must do for our children. So, kuchimiwach. Thank you, Elder Sherry Kobanes. I want to recognize all the community leaders and elected officials who are with us tonight. The fact that so many of you made the decision to join this conversation is a testament to the willingness that's out there to speak openly about racism and what we're going to do about it. So thank you. Before we begin, and we're just about ready to begin, just a housekeeping note. We, we are calling this an interactive panel discussion for a reason. You've probably seen the QR codes on the signs. We'd like you to take a moment to get your phones out, scan the barcode. I believe you can even point it up to the screen here, your, your camera, and it'll also open up the, the uh, Slido uh, deck that we have ready. And this will take you to that platform, Slido, where you can send in your questions anonymously to our panelists. You can ask questions on the platform through our gathering, and we'll select as many as we can for this Q&A. And they'll be coming up on this screen for our uh, panelists and for Natalie Bell, who I'm about to introduce, who is our moderator this evening. So excited. If you do need it, the barcode, the barcodes, if you need any help with the barcodes, just let us know. Put your hand up and we can help you out and hover it above the icon. As always, in everything we do, we ask everyone to be respectful of others, and we all have different perspectives and are, that are part of our work here at the museum is creating a space to have these conversations that matter, where folks might hold a different opinion to help us understand different opinions. So I'll thank you for, in advance for that. I'm now pleased to hand off things to our extraordinary moderator, Natalie Bell. Natalie uses she, her pronouns and has worked for a variety of organizations in both the public and the private sector for both non-union and unionized workplaces across several industries over the last 20 years. And I think she likes hockey. Natalie is also known for challenging the status quo and energizing all levels of organization to help elevate their workplace culture through a diversity, equity, inclusion lens. Natalie is a board director for North Forge Technology Exchange and an instructor for the University of Winnipeg's PACE program and president-elect of the Congress of Black Women of Manitoba. Natalie also fo fosters positive, authentic conversations via real-life storytelling on her social media networks, Do Follow Her. As an enthusiastic, hyper-local content creator, her handle is Peg City Lovely. She is a social, real talker in the community, and it is our pleasure to have her here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Bell. Thank you. Oh, hello, beautiful people. That's my trademark line for those of you that don't know. <laughs> First of all, before we even begin, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for being present for this conversation. That's what we're going to have here tonight, a conversation. And some of it may be uncomfortable. It may be uncomfortable, but you're here and we're gonna hear each other's perspectives, and we're gonna share what we're learning, we're gonna share what we're unlearning, and I just wanna thank you all for being here to do that. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to introduce our panel first and foremost. I will start with Aisha Khan. 
pronoun she, her, is a lawyer, educator, and community leader dedicated to building a culture of human rights in Canada and beyond. Her professional experience includes her tenure as executive director and senior counsel of the Manitoba Human Rights Commission, where she advanced several important rights-based initiatives and public education campaigns. She's a dedicated community volunteer who serves as board chair of United Way Winnipeg. In August of 2020, she began her role as CEO of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And throughout her life, Khan has helped build many communities where everyone is respected and empowered to reach their full potential. She continues to do that work here at the museum, engaging people around the world in a growing movement for hope and human rights. Aisha Khan. All right. Marie Chapman, she, her pronouns, is a CEO of the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, located at the National Historic Site in Halifax, where one million people, including immigrants, refugees, evacuee children, and war brides, first stepped foot in Canada between 1928 and 1971. Ms. Chapman has played a central role in the establishment of the museum and was appointed by the federal government in 2011 to the role of CEO, the first CEO. Marie Chapman. <laughs> and last but not least, <laughs> Mohammed Hashim has worked as a labor organizer and human rights advocate for over a decade. He has dedicated his career to supporting equity, inclusion, and community empowerment. He is currently the executive director of the Canadian Race Rela Relations Foundation and a member of the Board of Trustees of the United Way of Greater Toronto. Mr. Hashim is also a founding advisor of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. Welcome. Okay. Oh, do you see how the mic goes with me? <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're talking about conversation today, and I'm, I'm going to get comfortable. Is that okay? Yeah? yeah? All right. There's a couple things I want all of you to think about as we have this discussion this evening. A couple of things to reflect upon. Okay? Nothing that I want you to answer right now, but things to reflect upon as we're having this discussion. So the first thing is, what is important to you about addressing racism, okay? Think about that. What's important to you personally in addressing racism? And the second thing is, what are the contributions you can make or we all can make to create change? Everyone got those two? We're gonna be thinking about those as we listen to all of the information up here today. I want to say again, I, I really appreciate everyone being here because when we talk about this topic today, this is a topic that I have never not talked about. It's a topic that has been with me since the day I was born. The day many of us were born. It's very important, it's very serious. The fact that it's 2022 and we're still having to have these conversations is really important as well. So I just want to ask a quick question, show of hands if you're able. Would you consider swimming to be a life skill? Hands up. Okay. Uh, how many people know how to swim? Hands up. Oh, quite a few. How many people do not know how to swim? Hands up. How many people do not know how to swim because of racial trauma? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to share a little story with you before we get into the questions. It was 36 years ago when I was learning to swim in the school system back in Transcona, grade five. So yes, do the math. I'm going to be 47. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's all good. It's all good. I'm proud of my age looking. All right. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, learning to swim. Okay. So week after week, we would go to swimming lessons. Uh, I think at Kinsman Pool or whatever it was called. And then there was one day where we are to go to the deep end to tread water. 
So imagine Natalie, little Natalie, cute little Natalie, walking to the deep end. Two little boys behind her. We're almost at the deep end. <laughs> N-word, push in the deep end. I nearly drowned that day. I nearly drowned that day. I do not know how to swim to this day. I have three children, I have grandchildren. I tremble when there are large bodies of water. I fear driving in the monsoon kind of weather that we have where I can't see because there's water. I cannot swim because of racial trauma. A life skill I can't have because of the color of my skin. Sit with that for a second. That has been my life for 36 years, not being able to swim, not being able to go with my kids to swim because I can't step foot because two little boys, grade five, called me the N-word and pushed me in the deep end. And I think this is where it's really a good time to start talking with the panel about our topic today. <sighs> Sorry, let me just take a moment, because that I literally can see it to this day. So let's, let's, let's open it up with this question. Why is it important? <laughs> Why is it important that we talk about racism and think about what those root causes are? I shall start with you. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for sharing that story and just getting us situated a bit in the, um, in the importance of the conversation because I think there's a lot of conversations around racism happening out there and they don't always hit the same way. And, and that's okay too, mm -hmm. but, but, but thank you for sharing that. Why is it important? Um, because of that story. <laughs> because um, we haven't been talking about racism uh, the way we ought to or enough. Because if we were, we probably wouldn't have to have a panel and a museum built to talk about human rights and an exhibit that is designed for us to examine our own biases. Um, so that's why it's important, because the time is now. There's no better time than now uh, for us to have the conversation. I'll just reflect, I mean, you asked us to think about why is it important to you? And I have to tell you, as much as, you know, I kind of have some idea where these questions were going to go because, you know, we are a professional and we have a panel and we do those kinds of things. Um, but in the moment that you asked it and you said, why is it important to you? I changed all of the things that I was going to say. And uh, I'll tell you, it's important to me because I want to live in a world where people treat each other as kind humans. And thank you, Elder Sherry, for telling us that, for reminding us of that. You know, we talk about shared humanity all the time, um, or we talk about it all the time. I hope you're talking about it. Um, we can't actually get there until we actually dismantle and disrupt some of the systems that are around us, and they've been perpetuating racism. And I think, for me, it's important because I know that people need a road in to think about these issues. I feel like I've straddled all sorts of worlds my whole life, um, and I'm so full of privilege. I've been born into it, I earned it, and I was given it. And I think I take that and say, I have a voice and I want to talk about racism because it matters. And I think that's, um, so that's why it's important to me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mohammed, I see you're pensive over there. Well, uh, so first of all, thank you very much. I, I have to say, I haven't been in an in-person event in a well, I don't know. I can't remember at this point. <laughs> so I'm just really happy to be here. Yes, yes. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Good evening and assalamu alaikum to, 
that um, that means peace be upon you. I, just, I, I have to start by obviously thanking Elder Sherry uh, Cavendish for your words. I also, I, I, I mean, I'm from, so thank you, Aisha, for having me here. This is this he's is from a, Toronto, and we told him not to talk about it, but you know, it's like, <laughs> he's, he's, not, this is the lead into talking yeah. about Toronto. No, but I mean, like, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank all your staff from the Canadian, uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights who did so much work to put this together. So thank you, thank you, thank you to. to all. Let's give them a round of applause. Yes. This is the team is awesome. Stop being nervous. You're good now. <laughs> um, and also, I, I want to acknowledge that we have this incredible exhibit with Behind Racism. Um, it was not designed by me. It was designed by my predecessor, Lillian Ma, uh, who was the former executive director. Uh, and she did all the work. This is a passion pro This is her, her life's passion project. So I want to acknowledge that she was the one who actually created this, this. And as well as our team, including Angela Lee, Sharon Pun, and Priya. Um, Soveka, sorry, Priya, uh, Priya Ther Therasanam. Um, and I also have Rosalind Kang here uh, from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, who's our Western Regional Rep, uh, who came all the way from Calgary. So thank you, Rosalind, for coming as well. Um, and obviously, thank you to all the technicians. I'm a union organizer. I got to thank the workers. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way I roll. Um, but why is it important? You know, I think that. Uh, like Elder Sherry, what you said, you know, it's about your kids, um, that we have to make this place a better place because, you know, it, what's, what's really, you know, obviously what happened in Buffalo recently has held very heavily on me. Um, what happened in Texas, uh, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's soul crushing. Um, for me, I've seen you know, I was in Quebec City the day after the massacre, and um, I saw, you know, horrible things. But you know, one of the one of the things that I, I, I remember very vividly was there was a young girl who was about six years old, and she was in the mosque at the time uh, when the shooter was in there, and she was just running around like at every every other mosque, and um, at the back where. Kids are always playing in the background. And the adults are always getting annoyed with them because they're making noise. I'm not sure how that is in other faith <laughs> places, oh, <yeah>. but <laughs> you know that's that's standard practice in a mosque. And so that's what she was doing. And then when the person came in and started firing, um, the man at the back jumped on top of her, um, and she saw her father being shot that day. This happened in Canada. So when I was there the day after. I saw what the real consequences of racism look like. You know, when, you, when you've seen such violence in this world, you, you think to yourself, you know, how can there be hope? Um, but I also have an eight-year-old who jumps on me <laughs> every day and, mm -hmm. and demands a different world to be seen that way. Mm -hmm. And you know, just like Natalie, you were saying, and you shared, like, you know, one of my close friends, her, her, her brother um, was getting bullied all the way through school. And, you know, her other two siblings are incredibly successful, thoughtful people. He was on a trajectory. And the, just like the sheer bullying of that experience um, created really deep mental health issues for him. And now he's struggling in life. And, 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 and he's, you know, 42 years old. Mm -hmm. And the impacts are significant. So it's not like, like I'm giving you two extremes of obviously complete violence creating horrible consequences, but also stuff that, you know, people say it's not that big a deal, that have horrible consequences. And it matters because, you know, we have to have hope for, and we have to create a, a place where kids can hope mm -hmm. uh, and believe in that. Uh, and actually believe in a better place. So I think that, you know, that's a bit of a fluffy answer to it. But to me, it's, yeah. it's deeply personal. I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I want my kid and your kids and your grandkids um, to feel a sense of belonging, but also a sense of hope that they're not going to have to deal with these things. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Marie. 
Why is it important to also think about the root causes of racism? First of all, I just want to, again, echo the thanks to everyone. So nice to meet you today as well. Nice to be here in person. Aisha and I, um, Aisha started during the pandemic, so we got to meet physically for the first time today. And I also just want to mention that my boss, the chair of the board of the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 is Rob Weinberg, who's sitting in the audience because he is <laughs> a Winnipeg resident. So get that out of the way yes. first. <laughs> I think that if we don't think about the root causes of racism, then we can fix a symptom, but we actually have to get back and do the, the hard work mm -hmm. of getting back to what really started it. It's, it's like anything else where you can fix a symptom, but if you don't get to it, you won't. And the other thing I would say about that is that sometimes, and we're all going to just, I leaned over to Aisha during your, your talk, um, Elder Sherry, and said, we don't need to get up here. Let's just <laughs> listen to her the rest of the night, yeah. honestly, mm -hmm. because it does get back to love and kindness. And as children, we have that what gets in the way, what stops that, what others people. And it's hard because it's in all of us in some way, mm -hmm. which is why I love this exhibit. I, it, is not, it is not a complicated exhibit, and yet it gives you, I think, some concrete ways to make little differences that can start at that part. Yeah. And the data, right? Yeah. It's all connected to yes. data and science. So if yes. anyone hasn't gone in yet, I know some of you were in there and came good. out, but the, yeah. the, the basic biases yes. that yes. we probably don't really think about because, of course, our brains They're constantly so going. Millions yeah. and millions of data happening, being processing at any given time. And so we don't think about those things. And so to have this exhibit to challenge us in that way is yes. so important, yes. so yes. important. You know, most of the conversations I've had today have been about, you know, just the fact that we're here. Yeah. Just yeah. the fact that you probably already have walked through that exhibit or you're going to later this evening or you'll come back and you'll tell someone about it. I mean, that wouldn't have happened, um, no. I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ten ago. Years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so every time I think of those stories, about the things that are going on in our world yeah. that are ugly and, and so disheartening, I also then balance it out with, that makes you think. It's Someone awesome. stopped and thought. <coughs> they walked to their car and they gave it some thought, <coughs> chatted with yep. some people earlier this evening who'd been yep. through it and took a moment to just, oh, wait a second, think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. that's progress. Yes. That's important, mm -hmm. just as much as the empathy and sympathy and anger and anguish that we feel when horrible things happen. And so it's, it's kind of a complicated world right now, isn't it? Yeah. It's been complicated. Anyway, just thinking about that. It's been complicated. Yeah. Now, all of you are leaders of these institutions that are phenomenal to what this work is all about. So Canadian race relations, Can uh, Canadian uh, immigration, and human rights. So when you think about how racism is addressed within your institutions, can you share a story with us? Because just because they're named those things doesn't mean those things don't, that racism doesn't happen within your institutions as well, right? So I'm very curious to hear about uh, any stories you may have where you've been able to address that through your institutions as well. Marie, you're giving me good eye contact. I'm so just, I just <laughs> this is one thing you need to know about me. You look me in the eyes. Oh, um, it's over. Look, look, look at those eyes. My to look at those eyes. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to say one really quick anecdote, and then I'll get into something about our team and how sure. we're working to it. So we're the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21. So you'd think that people who come to the museum are interested in learning about immigration. Every once in a while, we get somebody who comes in and says, "That's a funny accent." And you kind of think, yeah, that means somebody speaks a different language better than we do, most likely, you know? And it's so interesting because these little things that happen, 
we used to call them little things, microaggressions that happen, um, are f uh, endlessly fascinating to our team given the name of our institution. So th there you have it. But what I would say is that two years ago, um, it, it, the first COVID winter, so um, our 14 of our team, we're a pretty small group, we're 52 full-time staff or so, like petite, but 14 of us got together who have levers of decision-making within the institution. What goes on a wall, what program we do, what we buy, who we hire, that kind of stuff. And we did some what we call Jedi work, um, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Also, Star Wars fans, I guess, so it sort of stuck. I like that. Stuck. I like it. It fit with Note us. Note to self, yeah. Jedi This work. Princess Leia's planet blew up, so she was a refugee. That how it happened. To, Pier 21. Anyway, yes. the geek thing still yeah. comes and you have to get a little humor once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, all that to say that we had four months of Anne Devine, who is an amazing woman, runs a, a group called Ashanti Leadership in Halifax, and Anne brought in different folks and we talked about unconscious bias and, and how to unpack that and how to welcome people. And it's not one thing to just have somebody on staff or come, but are they gonna feel welcome and are they gonna actually thrive in your organization? And, and at the end of this, some folks wanted to go off and start sort of discussion groups within the staff on things. And I said, look, you've got all of these levers, you've got budgets, you have power to make changes. Let's make the changes. Hmm. Let's do the things. And so what I'm really pleased about in a relatively short time, in a year, is we've been able to add, um, we had some staff turnover as one does, and five of our new team members are visible minorities. Um, another team member got promoted from within, and we have a quarter of our staff are visible minorities in a town, I should say, so it's a little different from the statistics side. Nova Scotia, in the last census, we don't get the new numbers till October, so this is a little geeky, but 4% visible minority, Halifax, 11%. So quite a bit lower than a lot of places in the country catching up. But our numbers are significantly higher than that. And it's important, we're an immigration regime, they should be. But what the staff has learned is, do it. it words are important, don't get me wrong, and words can really obviously be dangerous and, and hard. Do it. We have the power to make the change. And that has been really amazing for our team during COVID. To feel like during COVID when we didn't, let's, we lost a lot of control over things and trying to plan and unplan, we still could do something to make it, it better. So we'll see, but it's, it's been a real, that part of the last two years has been hard and good. Yeah, and the impact of of doing versus just talking, yes. right? That yes. is the key. Yes. It's the, the action. Mm -hmm. What are the things we can do? And they don't have to be grandiose things. There's small things we can each do every single day. Mm -hmm. Every single day. And we'll, we'll probably share some of those here, but I want to continue on with the, the impacts in your institutions and how you address racism. And I'll, you're looking at me so wonderfully. So, so now, guess what? I'm going to talk about this. <laughs> Um, so here you are at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Um, you know, why did we want to host this exhibition? Because this is part of our journey, right? Um, and it's one piece of work that we're doing. Um, and there's all the things that you would imagine. There's training, there's workshops, there's time spent together. Um, there's intentional attention to ceremony. Um, to learning about indigenous ways of knowing and being because this is this museum on this land in this place, this gathering place um, at the Forks and because we're a museum for human rights and let's start with making sure that we have the relationships we ought to with the first peoples of this land. But um, okay, so I could talk forever, but what I'll say is this. Um, I think, when I think about uh, this museum and uh, having um, been called to account so mm -hmm. publicly uh, by people who worked here, by people, you know, former employees, current employees, and then the public around us, um, put us in this position to say, okay, what are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. And before I even got here, we will be transparent and we will 
make change. And so I walked in at a time where there was already this impetus to make change. And so my job, in a way, was kind of easy, although I look back and actually, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to it, it nice. hasn't always been easy. Yeah. Um, but there was already this motivation to change. And I think the, one of the biggest things that I probably was challenged with was everyone else's idea about how you were going to make change and how you were going to disrupt racism and this is what it should look like and you should, you know, get rid of your staff and you should, you know, put this much money into training and have these courses and bring these people in. And I just needed to quiet down all that noise and think about what are we actually trying to do here? Well, if we're trying to change the way people think, it starts in those tiny moments. And so I have like so many stories, but I'll just say the stories that I think about the most about where I've seen change, and it's going to sound kind of hokey, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's like riding the elevator with someone and having a chat with them and looking in their eyes and talking about something that's going on and realizing they want this place to be different. We want to treat each other better. It's in quiet moments chatting with someone or being in a meeting on Zoom, on, you know, Zoom or Teams and someone asking a question that they might not have asked three months ago or six months ago, either because they didn't feel safe to ask the question before mm -hmm. and now they can, or they actually wanted to call out what they were actually feeling or interrupt someone and, and raise a point of view that um, perhaps um, they couldn't before. I mean, that's where I see change. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I wish I had this like beautiful, like, this is what you do. Yes, no. And I think people do Too it easy. the way they want it. Yes. Um, and they'll do what's right for their institution at their time. Mm -hmm. But it's just look for tiny, small moments because you need incremental change as much as you need yeah. big, bold, structural moves. But you need both, yes. right? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to jump in there too. because Well, I, I, I was just going to ask you because your organization is Canadian Race Relations. Yeah, and we don't get it perfectly either. <laughs> so, I mean, like, to be frank, like, it's, 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 you know, because no matter what you, like, so obviously, you know, as a Canadian Race Relations Foundation, you would, you would think that, yes, we got it everything perfectly on, on all things. But to be honest, like I've, I've, I talk about diversity and inclusion all the time and I've never met a single person who's like, I got it all figured out. Uh, I don't, I certainly don't. And I, I, and I think that I'm, I haven't dealt with a single institution that has. So if they're telling you that they got it all sorted out, please check yourself a little bit, you know? Like I think that like, um, and because like, I think things change, like, you know, people see um, different things uh, and different perspectives on things, and it's difficult to deal with. I think that, you know, sometimes we've been criticized that we're not doing enough on anti-black racism, or we're not doing enough on anti-Semitism, or we're not doing so enough on, on A, B, C, D, which is all true, which is all true. Um, and, you know, so I think that part of what my commitment is to say, look, you know, we're not going to get it right all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to try our best to get it right as much as we possibly can. Our intentions are true. Um, and I hope that to build a sense of a, a trust where people believe that our intentions are true and that our deeds will follow and that because we are going to make sure those spaces are better, I think that's the best that I could do. Um, because you can't control everything that everybody says in every single workplace. It's impossible to do so as a leader of that organization or even what you do sometimes. Because, you know, people read things differently. Mm. So I think, first of all, just being a bit generous as well on it. I, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not one to say, well, you didn't do what I told you to do, so you're racist. <laughs> like, like, I mean, it's a bit harsh <laughs> to say, I, I, but I think that, you know, it's, it's, about in, it's not just about intentions, and don't please ever think that I said it's about those intentions, um, but I think it's about hoping to try to build trust, to be able to do the right thing, and, and hoping, 
hopefully living up to that, uh, that earned trust. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think about media. Other media folks. <laughs> <laughs> media, social media, all of these things. And I, those of you that know, I practically live on social media every second of the day. I'm surprised I haven't taken a picture of you all yet oh, to yeah. post it, but I will. Um, I think about the work we can do in our communities, and I will tell you that my digital community, as things occurred with George Floyd last year, as Black Lives Matter continued to be talked about and, and um, exposed in many different ways, I can tell you that from a digital community perspective, people were just so outraged, they were so contemplative. They were wanting to know, oh my gosh, this is, wow, wow, and you've experienced this before, Natalie? Here in Canada, this is, this is something that has happened to you, this kind of racism? And so my question to all of you is that, what could we possibly do or gain from continuing to do this deep work in our communities? What's possible? What is possible for us if we continue to do that deep work? What are some of the steps we probably should take to do that? Not just, you know, social media, but within our communities. And Marie looked at me, so oh, she's no, going first. Did. Sorry. Well, <laughs> I, I looked away. I always think about, <laughs> when you said what possible, I think about what Elder Sherry said, because I, we had an event two weeks ago, a fundraising dinner, and at the end I go up to thank and I say, gosh, you know, if we had peace in the world and grace every day in our heart, then we wouldn't need to have these, these conversations, you know? And so when Elder Sherry said that, I thought, yeah, like what is possible is loving kindness. Mm. At the end of the day, that's what we all wish to have. And so that we each look at each other and see the whole person. Mm -hmm. Aisha and I talked about this earlier mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And why we need to do it is so that your eight-year-old and your girls and you, nobody gets pushed in a pool again. I just always think about these lovely little humans and, and how they deserve to just feel safe mm -hmm. and themselves mm -hmm. in all of their loveliness. And so that's the part of what is possible and why we keep doing it is the same answer. Yeah, me. I, mean, I mean, for me, it's, you know, I. I a lot of the work that we, we don't actually do individual cases of racism as, at our organization because well, that would be a lot. Mm. <laughs> but a lot of the work that we're focused on is on systems. So I co-chair a task force on hate crimes where we're creating uh, national police standards around hate crimes investigations and reporting and, and, and co-chairing that with the RCMP. Um, that's, like, for us, for me, it's, it's about systems change. Because, you know, this, this exhibit over here is meant to challenge the way you think. I'm not going to be prescriptive here to say, like, look, you got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I don't know where you're at. You know where you're at, right? Like, I, I kind of think in numbers all the time where I'm like, okay, my level of effort on this is 7 out of 10. Hopefully, once you see this thing, it gets up to eight out of ten or a nine out of ten. He's been doing this numbers thing. Like he <laughs> rates everything. Day. I was like, "How are you everything. feeling?" He gave me a number. Seven. How's this breakfast? He gave me a number. It's, it's very interesting way of looking at the <laughs> world. He has the old figure skating numbers that come out like this from way back. Wait till he gets into sorry. the increments of like point know, ones. Point, I'm sorry, sorry. This is serious. Sorry. And please yes. continue with your your rating. You, He's yeah. Never gonna with us. I, I, this is a num This is a ten this point that you're making, and yes. I'd like, yes. so actually Sorry. it's more like a 9.6, so please, yeah, I don't know. Go to 10, yes. go to 10, Mom. One more. It's really nice being trolled by two CEOs, yeah. eh? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel 9.5 <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, like, like, like look, like, like, where are you at? Like, what, what do you actually want to see? Like, all of you here, because you care, or you give a little bit of a, Oh, you care, right? I'm going to assume that. I'm going to assume that. But like also, it's like, you know, what are, where are you situated? What's within your grasp? Like, are, are you just, like, are you figuring out, are you even thinking two seconds to say like, hey, 
what is my responsibility in this conversation? Um, and because I'm not going to tell you what you need to do, you kind of know what you need to do. Mm. You really do. Um, and you got to figure out, okay, here, like, you know, in my space, this is, if I have to go, I'm not going to use my seven out of tens, but like, <laughs> how do I go increments higher? I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but honestly, like, and take responsibility for that and hold yourself to respond. Like, you know, you, if you're going to have, if when you want to lose weight, you set yourself a diet. I'm not so good at that. But like, you know, like you, 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 you create your own goals. Like, honestly, like, like I, the reason why I'm saying this is it's so important because, you know, I, I travel this country like coast to coast and I've seen the impact of what this has on people. And it's really dark. Mm -hmm. And it, it kills me to know that like, you know, this is where we're leading this country. And to be honest, today I'm more scared than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like we're going in the wrong direction. Honestly, I feel like we're going in the wrong direction. I feel like there's a lot of good thoughts and prayers out there. I couldn't give a damn about thoughts. Oh, sorry, the kids. <laughs> like, I, I, I couldn't care about like, thoughts and prayers. I want to see people taking action on stuff. Yeah. So, like, you know, figure out where you're at. And whether that's, like, in your seniors club or where you're, you know, like, your workplace, like, you just got to figure out, okay, here. And, like, if you're a person that's holding on to this stuff that you you felt like you can't say things, say it. You know, take that deep breath, say it. Like allow somebody else to, like, to be in on it with you um, because that also creates space. Mm. Uh, and invite people to this conversation versus pushing them away. Like I'm, I, I hate call-out culture because like I'm, I'd rather have a straight convo with you <laughs> to figure out where things are really at. But like, you know, have this conversation in a meaningful way with whoever it might, you might feel like you can touch and bring into this conversation in a way that is meaningful that will create change. Because like this, this exhibit here talks about your individual perceptions and how you create bias of your own. And stuff that we create bias on our own is really normal. Mm. But it, and it's normalized. But when we, when we deconstruct how those biases are created, we realize like, oh, we, I came to that conclusion because of ABC. Maybe I shouldn't have gone that way. But what I'm telling you is that this country as a whole, our laws, our criminal justice system, our, like, like there's so many pieces that I look at from our national security infrastructure to our employment regime to our you know, human rights like tribunals and whatnot. That might be my wife calling. But um, I, all of these systems are built upon individuals who have made decisions along the way. Mm -hmm. And those biases feed, are fed from those things. So the responsibility is, is really on, on all of us. And, and you particularly, whether you're, you're pushing for something or you're owning it or you're using that opportunity to push further, that's really where the opportunity lies. Would you say the ultimate goal would be to not have to worry about having a Canadian Race Relations Foundation? Mm -hmm. You know, I gave Canadian up on that idea. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is ever gonna, we're ever going to get to a place like that. Yeah. I wish we would. I have hope. But, like, maybe we get to a 97 out of 100. Yeah. <laughs> numbers. Rest the numbers. Yes. 97. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. take that. We'll take 97. 100%. I ain't got no belief in that happening. As we're addressing these things, though, in our communities, wholly in our communities, what are some of those challenges that you've heard about or are seeing that are happening that we, we need to find ways to overcome? Aisha? So, I'm a part of a lot of conversations where people, you know, we talked about being motivated and we, we want to do things. One of the challenges is sometimes we want to move too quickly mm. and we don't think about the impact. So just think about um, diversity. And I'll just say this, I actually hate talking about diversity because I'm over talking about diversity. I want to talk about inclusion. Yeah. It's you trendy. Know, it's, it's very trendy. And, and, and people talk about diversity like there's this new thing out there called, you know, everyone's talking about diversity. Um, there's a whole lot of people who've been talking about diversity for a very, very long time. And so it's, you know, it's straddling that with having, 
you know, the generosity of spirit to say, okay, we're finally talking about it and I want to be part of the conversation. So um, I think, and I just want to disagree for a moment with one of the things that Mohammed said. Oh, yes. Okay, let's go. It was the, his rating. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. It wasn't his rating. His ratings are fine. Um, poor guy. Uh, it was, and, and I, I respect that you feel like we're going in the wrong direction. And I think, so I totally respect that. I actually don't think that. I think that, and maybe it's just that I don't know what direction we're going in, and that's my own mm. looking after myself a little bit and protecting mm -hmm. that yeah. I don't know which way it's going. I have mapped. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but what I feel like is we are at this very particular, special moment in time, and we kind of have a choice about what we're going to do. And I think about Black Lives Matter, I think about the... Um, uh, acknowledgement of the number of unmarked graves across this country um, that has come to light, and I use those words very specifically because mm -hmm. many knew that those were there all this time, but there is a, a, a more global recognition. Um, I think about the hate crimes, like all of the things that have sort of led us to this moment in time, and I I don't want to make it bigger than it is, but I actually think it is, this is the time to act. If we don't act now, you know, what do we have for that future that we just talked about for our kids? Mm. Mm -hmm. So I feel like maybe we have this opportunity to change the trajectory. And then I'm, I'm a natural optimist, so I think that we're going to go in the right direction, and that's why I look for all those little moments, and I look at the fact that there are people here, and they're going to go away, and they're going to think about it, and they're going to take Muhammad's call to action, and they're going to think about what they're going to do that's within their grasp. Um, but I think one of the challenges is, uh, and I just want to come back to this point, I hear people wanting to increase diversity. Yes. Right? Uh, whether it's, you know, a board that they're on or staff in their workplaces. And I just often, a little part of me gets irked and thinks, you know that you want to increase diversity because you know that it's important to have an organization that's representative of the community that you serve. Progress. But you're going to bring people into this organization sometimes too quickly. You're going to set benchmarks and you're going to say, we're going to say, you know, we're going to get this many people. And we're going to reach out and find these people. and We don't know where to find them. We're going to find them. We're going to pull them into this organization. And the caution just is sometimes know that it's OK to pace yourself mm -hmm. because you need to be ready to have those people in your organization. Yes. Because people like all of us, and many of the people in this room do this work, mm -hmm. and it's hard work. And you have to be in a place that's ready to listen to you. And so to me, and I don't by any means mean don't do anything, um, because there is an urgency. It's just look around and make sure that you're pacing the change that you want to see and that there are people that are coming with you. Yes. That's the challenge, is that I think sometimes we don't give enough thought to the pace yes. of this work. And it doesn't mean that, you know, because it should have happened yesterday, mm -hmm. as we started with. Yeah. But I think if we actually want to make systemic change, we have to bring people with us. Um, I, can, I, can you indulge me for one second? Of course. So, of course. So I was thinking about you traveling across the country I was thinking about you talking about human rights tribunals and, and, and like shout out to the uh, head of the Manitoba Human Rights Commission who's in this yes. room. So in this province mm. looks at every, Karen Sharma, <laughs> who looks at uh, every uh, complaint of discrimination that's made by a person in this province and having had the privilege to, to have, have been in that role before I came here, I'll say this, you get to understand the personal, the individual cases of discrimination and what that feels like. Some are grounded and, you know, in, in, they have evidence to support them, some don't. It doesn't matter, but you get to see that lens. And then you go out into the community and you have these conversations about systemic change. And the possibility is you actually sometimes see people change the way they think. Mm -hmm. 
you have a mediated agreement and you work with someone and you get them to understand what their actions were regardless of intention and the impact that they had and you see it before your eyes. So the possibility, I think, is immense. Like, we can do this. We just have to give a little bit of thought to what you just said. What is our personal accountability? You're going to disagree with me. I know. <laughs> I, I know. I'm going to stop the speech. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and, and I'm going to actually say I was wrong. I think you're right. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, uh, honestly, what I was, like, I've had... It's been a like, hard two days. I've been, I've been talking to community members over here for the last two days, and yeah. maybe I was just carrying a bit too much on me right there. No. I think that's, that's kind of where I, I was coming from. I agree with you. I think we are, we are likely going in the right direction. I also don't like saying we're, like, going in the right direction because I'm a scrappy human being, and I like, <laughs> and I, and I like kind of uh, pushing on stuff always, um, but I was wrong and you're right. No, come Terrible. on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we could do a debate thing here. Continue, continue. I'll take it. <laughs> oh my goodness. I want to be mindful of time, so I have one more question for all of you so that we can get questions from all of you. I hope you are putting in some questions in Slido or you're ready. There are folks here ready with the microphones, so be prepared. This is the last question. It's your turn. Okay. Okay. All right. So what are you looking forward to as a leader in your institution as it relates to anti-racism and looking beyond racism? Murray. So um, really, to start lately, I'm just looking forward to having more humans in our building this summer. Yes. Yeah. Let's just start with yes. so exciting yeah. as museums to have people in. Digital is great, we love it, we need it, but boy, it's really nice to have people in the room again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I'm looking forward to is over the longer term, as we, again, do the right work to make sure that our teams feel welcome. I love, we have an ex, a, a touring exhibition called Refuge Canada. It's got a, a UNHCR tent in it. And we have stories of when that has traveled around the country of people taking the time to email us and say, I lived in one of those for 10 years, mm -hmm. and it's so cool to see it and to know it's part of this, and I shared it with my friends. What I am looking forward to is people seeing themselves more in these institutions, for mm -hmm. people to come into this exhibit and go, yeah, that's what it felt like, and here is why we... I look forward to those moments again that lead up to hopefully Muhammad having less to do in his job yes. of these individuals that are going into law school mm -hmm. and making decisions and are elected officials, knowing that it's so important to make, th to do those thoughts, to take those moments of who am I excluding from this conversation? Who's missing from this? Why aren't they here? How can we get them here? And seeing that go forward. And what I find in our institution is um, the more our visitors look and respond to seeing their story or some similarity of themselves, the more they feel part of the country and willing to actually have some, feel they can speak up about it, they yeah. hear. So yeah. for us, that's the exciting part to see it grow. Yeah. So I just I, want some I people see, to. I see Mohammed writing there. So yeah, Mohammed to... is writing. He's just rating your thing. I know, I don't know, I'm, I'm nervous now. <laughs> I'm gonna get said. the numbers, <laughs> 2.6. Go ahead, Aisha, I'll, I'll, I'll go after you. You can go ahead. Um, there's a couple of things I'm very excited about. Um, there's online harms legislation that's coming forward, which is going to curtail yeah. online hate. Um, yes. Okay. Had it's, enough of that. It's. Yeah. It's brutal. I think that's long overdue. I think the federal government knows that. I think that society knows that. Um, we did a survey recently. Almost 80% of women, young women, racialized women, um, experience online harm, like online hate. We're yeah. drinking from a fire hose right now in this country around this. And, it's, and, it, and people believe that nothing can be done about it. And when they believe nothing can be done about it, they actually lose faith in the system. Uh, and when you lose faith in the system, you lose your democracy. Mm -hmm. You see the polarization of how people are weaponizing the loss of faith in, in democ democracy. And because you have no standard to hold each other accountable to, there's no, 
like we. It becomes all about me. And, and I, I really have incredible hopes around online hate legislation that's, that's coming forward, hopefully in the fall. Um, there's employment equity legislation. I, I'm, so I'm just gonna go right into the, this is where my head's at. <laughs> um, employment equity legislation, which can, has the potential to transform workplaces across this country. Uh, that, there's a national task force that's, being, that's got incredibly bright minds that are looking at this currently. I'm really looking forward to that because, you know, like 96% uh, of black employees, according to a survey that we did called Blackness in Canada with York University, have experienced racial discrimination in the workplace. 96% of people. You know, that's 24 out of 25, I think. Um, you got that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I think um, we got an issue of policing in this country. It's bad, you know? People don't feel, like I was talking to someone very senior within the, like the National Center of Truth and Reconciliation. She's got a three-year-old. And she's like, I don't know what I'm gonna teach my kid, whether they should, if something hateful happened, should, they, should she or should she not go to the cops? I'm like, yo, you're a university professor, tenured, you got, like you're the head of this, like you're like, you know, a senior person in this national organization and you can't trust the cops to believe you? Mm. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that saying about our policing system, right? Um, people don't trust that. I've, I met with community members, like, all of yesterday and today, and maybe one or two of them said, yes, I would tell a community member to go report a hate crime here in Winnipeg. Can you believe that? People are telling not their community members not to go to the police. Why? Because when you go there, you won't be believed. If you're believed, they might write something down and it might do, but the chances of you, something happening out of that, that trust is so low that it's better to just not go to them. Hmm. It's better not to have to relive that in front of a police officer than to expect justice. Like, it's mind-boggling. Lots needs to happen over here. And the, and, the, and, the, and the one thing that I'm really, like, I'm, I'm keen on is that currently when we talk about racism or, or hate in particular, we look at, you know, the online hate systems and we look at, you know, like, you know, like social media platforms and we're looking at policing and the, like the law enforcement role of it. But what's missing from this conversation, in my honest opinion, are victims, mm. their perspectives. Because I think if all of us sat down with the victim of hate and had a conversation, tomorrow all of us would know, you know, how to fix it and be motivated to fix it. We silence victims in this world uh, at, at the cost of allowing the continuation of harm. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sick and tired of that. I want to see, I want to see that mm -hmm. split. Like, what am I going to say after that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're a museum, uh, as you all know. <laughs> museum for Human Rights. So what am I looking forward to for our institution? Um, I'm looking forward, so first, you know, plug, I'm looking forward, like this is an exhibition opening and this is my first public exhibition opening and it is amazing and so I'm looking forward to many more of these. Yes. Uh, Beyond the Beat, music of resistance coming Super cool. to this museum soon. Um, uh, <laughs> but I'm, you know, from a very sincere place, what I'm looking forward to is working in relationship with all of you to be more brave, mm. to actually having the conversations that need to be had about human rights, uh, to bringing us all first together because we need to build relationships. Um, we have some very strong relationships. We need deeper relationships in community. Um, and then being part of that movement. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking forward to. 
I think we have stories, we have, I always talk about privilege, but, but really we share stories of all of you. Yeah. We, we're just here to share your story. We'll yeah. help you tell your story because the story matters. And so those relationships are the key. And so I am looking forward to us doing that together. And those stories get more and more brave because of conversations like this. The legislation shifts, but so do the people who move that legislation. The people who you work with and the stories you tell, like that's our job. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. That's what I'm looking forward to. I like And it. answering all the questions, questions that are now going yes, to come. And I'm yes. going to rate them all, just like you told yes. me. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I, are there I'm any folks who want to <laughs> get up and use a microphone? Put your hand up. I do have the little Slido app here. Oh, there we yeah, go. There's five Slidos. Yes. Oh, wow. So I got to tell a story about my glasses and how I have progressives, oh, but not today. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, thank, you. thank you, thank <laughs> you. Yes, going to stop at the drug mart on the way home. <laughs> there we go, okay, okay. Um, oh, this is a great question here. Was raising a generation in an I don't see color mindset more harmful than helpful, and in which mindset should we raise the next generation? Who wants to take that one? We discussed we this just this talked morning. about this. We just yeah. talked about it, so it's fresh. Let's go. Go ahead. Go ahead. So was it, okay, so no judgment. Was raising a generation no in yep. an I yeah. don't see color mindset more harmful than helpful, and in which mindset should we be raising the next generation? You want to go? Well, I, I will actually say that you walk through behind racism, you see the science of you do see color. Yeah. You might, your brain just goes so fast and you make quick assumptions. So I would say that what we need to do is, is talk more about, and maybe not using the words unconscious bias all the time, but talking about how our brains work and mm -hmm. how we do quick things. And then the quick things become the things that are the shortcuts that mean that people get forgotten or assumptions are made or all the things. So I, I don't know that that's a fancy answer, but I would say that we see color. Yeah. We definitely do. Without judgment, but we see color. And I guess I would say to the to the question, I mean, it's only with hindsight that you can kind of comment on it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I say no judgment in the sense that um, just <laughs> that's how many people were raised. And I mean, I, I was not raised that way, but raised in that um, frame of mind as well. Um, but was it more harmful? You know, perhaps, perhaps it has just amplified the work that we have to do now because there's so much unlearning that we're doing now. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the number of times we, we hear, right, like, um, and the number of times I've been told, like, I don't see you as this or that, you know, I don't see you as a Muslim. Well, and it was probably only in my 20s, and it was probably right after 9-11, and I was like, well, I kind of do want you to see me as a yes. Muslim. Yeah. Um, you know, but as a kid, I thought, oh, I'll just blend and it's good. And, you know, I f faked that I was going to go to catechism class with my friends. And <laughs> so my mom was like, I don't think you should go. But, you know, anyway, I guess what I'd say is this, I, I, I think, yeah. I think it's a difficult question. I think with yeah. hindsight, we'd say, yeah, but would we have done things differently? I don't know. It was the 70s, the 80s, you know, the 90s. Um, let's just focus on to that question, like, what are we gonna do next? Going forward, yeah. 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 Uh, do you think social media has enabled or encouraged racism, or do you think oh. it just emboldens people who are racist to be more loud about it? Oh. Read that to me one more time, please. Yes. yes. Oh gosh, now I have to put them back. <laughs> okay, do you think social media has enabled or encouraged racism? Yes. Or do you think it just emboldens people who are racist to be more loud about it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Answers is yes oh. to all, right? Yeah, I mean, like, like, like rage sells. Uh, like, so, I mean, social media platforms are created with the idea of uh, retention. How long do you stay on the platform? What, how, so everything that they've designed is to ensure that you stay on that platform yeah. longer. So whether that's your you know, 30 second TikTok video to your 
you know, like to something that's like, that's clickbaity, that is interesting. Like, you know, your social media universe is just your social media universe. It's catered directly to you mm -hmm. in order to keep you on that platform for as long as possible so that they can make as much money by exposing you to as many ads as possible. That's the business model. So what keeps people online longer? Stuff that's like emotionally charged, that will get you angry, that will have you thinking a certain way. Um, and that, that emotional connection uh, is money in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like does social media enable people to be louder or does it encourage them to be louder? Absolutely. Because the louder you are, the more views you get, the more emboldened you feel, the more popular you feel, the more powerful you feel. You're with your people. And the more and you grow that audience. Thing. And that audience yes. growth is not just determined by like, the content of your intelligence, <laughs> but the saleability of your anger. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's designed to do that. It's also designed with an algorithm. Yes. And those algorithms put you with people who all think like you. And so you go, it puts you in those media spaces. A whole lot of people read the New York Times, a whole lot of people are on CNN, a whole lot of people are on other, you know, Fox. It's just the way it works. And so one of the things, again, I go back to the exhibit because we were talking about this this morning and then I saw the Martin Luther King quote in the exhibit that talks about, I'm convinced men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other and they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other and they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. And social media puts you That's like the in perfect these code. places. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it separates us more again. And so it's an echo chamber where you get emboldened. Yeah. And I think it does. It's sneaky. And there's parts of it we all love, and, but you have to know when you're going into it that it's figuring out who they think you are, the algorithms, and it's putting you with people that then makes all that other piece happen. Yes. And I just want to say it's, it is fixable, right? See, I think that there's ways to tone down these algorithms as well mm. that we know is hateful. Yes. I believe there is someone in the crowd with a question. There's a couple that are Hello. here. Hello. Okay. Hi. Oh, I should stand up. Yes, please. <laughs> um, I have a very loud voice, so I'm, I'm terrified of microphones. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, actually, for placing this conversation regarding racism in a human rights museum. I think that's really important. Um, I tried to write this as a question and I couldn't do it within the amount of space I had. <laughs> so if we, look, think, if we recognize the relationship between fear and racism, which was yeah. what was just discussed, and especially the fear of losing power and the fear of those in power losing power, mm. yeah. how do we engage with people who fear that they are going from being the majority to being the minority. Mm -hmm. Whether it's through immigration, whether it's through this fear of I'm somehow losing my status, how do we engage with those people and that and, and racism? Well, that's a good one. I'm gonna answer this actually yeah. a little bit here. And uh, because it's recently occurred in some conversations I've had where uh, you know, being on a committee or a board or whatnot or any kind of organization where there are predominantly white men and then, you know, I'm on the committee or someone else is on the committee and my voice is getting louder, as it should be, right? I'm sharing my perspective, not just as a black woman, just as a human being, I'm sharing my perspective. And comments I've heard are, well, <sighs> The white men just can't win anymore now, right? White men just don't matter anymore now. Yeah. It's not that you don't matter. It's not that you're being dismissed. It's the fact that you've always been up here and we are coming up. And we need to do this, right? It's not about knocking you down. 
It's about you moving aside and recognizing the rest of us who have not had the privilege and the power and the finances and the, all the things to, to do what you've been able to do in this world. That is what is happening. And so it's education, it's awareness, it's having those conversations to say, it's not about making it bad for you. It's about leveling up other people, bringing other people up who have been underrepresented for all this time. Oh, I'm getting passionate, sorry. It's good. <laughs> I'm just like, whoo, I'm just gonna stand up and take off my mic and anyways. I'll just, I'll, I'll add to your point. Yes, add, um, please. And I probably won't say anything that much more poignant than you just did about leveling the playing field, right? Um, but what, I often think about that, that aspect of fear um, because I think, I think there's ignorance that, that certainly motivates racism and that's kind of an easy way to answer the question. And you know, some people talk about it's a lack of education, you know, however you look at it, but I actually don't think it's ignorance, I think it's fear. Um, so I think you've hit the question. I don't know that I have the answer, but what I, sometimes controversial, but what I would say is, um, there are moments where in order to get to where you want to go, you have to recognize with compassion that that is fear. Um, and that, and it's not every moment, and I always have to sort of qualify that, but there are certain moments where if you recognize that people are afraid of giving up power, that the way to get them to give it up is to be gentle with them. So not to let them have excuses, but to find a way to get to that core principle in human rights that we are all born free and equal mm -hmm. in dignity and in rights. We are all worthy of respect. And sometimes getting there is that small moment yeah. where you relate to them, right? Because um, you know they're afraid. And when they open up to you, you use that opportunity to build that connection. Bridge. Mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot of people who just don't know. And you know, there was that question about like, how do we do it? I think, um, yeah, the time to act is now, but I think we have to acknowledge that we don't always know how. And, and that's, okay. that's okay. We have to create space to, to talk about the fact that we don't know how to make things better, but we want to, um, and you probably do know, <laughs> to your point. You probably do know, just look within you. You know what it's like. You know what it looks like to treat someone with respect. Mm -hmm. And you know what it looks like when you don't. So, yeah, I, I don't have a great answer on, on the fear point, but I think you hit it. Yeah, that's, that's the hardest question of, of this generation, in my opinion. I think that populism is driven by that fear. I think political movements are gaining steam by that fear. Mm. I think that... Um, politics are moving like emotionally, that mm -hmm. um, weaponizing that fear. Um, and I honestly, if I had the answer to that, I could solve against <laughs> populism. A lot of right? things. You put yourself <laughs> out of a job. Um, I, but, I, but it's like, I mean, when you, when, you, when you read and listen to the testimony of mass murderers, which I sometimes do, um, it's fear. It's 100% fear. It's never, like, hate comes out of fear. Mm. Shame. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily, like, I mean, I'd, I've, at one point in my life, I was like, you know, Frederick Douglass said, you know, power never concedes anything without a demand. Um, so I would be like, take power instead. Um, <laughs> where my mindset used to be, where I, you know, just win by any means necessary. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I, that was my younger self. I'm not, a, I'm not exactly sure where I'm at right now on that one. But I think that the equal, like there's, like I think the kind answer and the more motivating answer is yours. Um, I'm not sure what's the most effective way to deal with it. I think that, you know, acknowledging um, a desire to have uh, a better reality for, for others um, shouldn't be a, 
shouldn't make people fearful. Mm -hmm. That's something wrong with them. Um, and in a way, I kind of don't want to have to deal with that anger because that's not my, I feel like it's not my responsibility, but except that it sits on my shoulders and I have to bear it, and I, it's a bit unbearable. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, I, could, I was gonna add another layer, but I know we're running out of time. So I know there was another person in the crowd who had a question. It's right up front here. There we go, there's the mic there. First of all, is this working? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, everything you said is, all, each one of you has been brilliant and, and, and really, really enjoyed listening to you. <laughs> and, uh, but my question. She likes the 9.7 from her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my, uh, my question, I guess, has to go to. Um, to Halifax, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Marie, Marie. Okay. Marie. I like Halifax, uh, yeah. it's good. <laughs> um, because we've been, or you've been talking and we've been listening to that you said that small steps are really important just as, as totally. big steps yep. in terms of uh, um, addressing racism. Um, but Marie, uh, Marie, yeah. uh, you had said in your opening remarks about roots, how we had to get back to the roots of racism yeah. and I'm not quite understanding what that means or when we have to go back to the roots it seems I guess I'm from what you have been saying and what I believe that we have to deal with things today and treat people equally at the same level and what's the importance I guess to you or, or to racism itself about going back to its roots I think it, it's like a root cause. Yes, yes. And to me, that root cause, again, goes back to the shorthand that we learn and the things that we see. It's, it's almost like what Muhammad's doing right now and the work that the Canadian Race Relations Foundation's doing right now with the big institutional pieces, at the end of, well, but <laughs> at the end of the day, somebody made a decision to pass a law or somebody, like, mm -hmm. you have to go back as you, you, you have to go back to that bias that we feel so that, that we check it. Like, I'll give you a simple example from our office. You know, now before we do a post a job somewhere, we used to post in these three places, you would get the same type of candidate that gave you a pool that was this big instead of this big. You know, it's, it's, it's checking yourself all the time to making sure that you're not excluding. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the foundational piece for us. Because most people, we would can quibble about numbers of how many people are racist, overt, as, but I think there's a big middle of people with very good intentions that perhaps make decisions that exclude people that have consequences that snowball mm. into something bigger. And then you see all of a sudden that everybody who takes a degree in museum studies for a long time were white privileged women who could afford to take seven years of education and get a really bad wage. Mm. <laughs> I, 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 to start, I, 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 I just, <laughs> and so that excludes a whole group of people. So I guess again, it's getting back to that piece of how do we get more people into this? Why is this a stream that only certain people come in and then they get to make all the decisions? I'm not sure I'm expressing myself yes, very well, no, but yeah. it's, that's it the root. It's there. getting back at the nugget instead of saying, we can only hire these people because only these people are getting out of school. Well, why? Why are only those people going to school? Why is, like, you, you have to peel the onion layers back, yes. I guess. Yeah. No, that was, I think that was a great answer. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. From Halifax. Yes, from <laughs> I have to, uh, oh, Chandra, we've got one more. Okay, all right, one more. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> Elder Sherry, yes. We're all gonna sit up. I, um, first, I just wanna thank you all. I, I uh, wasn't gonna stay, but then I got interested in the conversation. <laughs> no, and yes, for that. Okay, big witch, big witch. Yes. We feel and, like we um, passed. But we you passed, know, we true. passed, we totally passed. The, the elephant in the room, you know, the C word, colonialism, 
Yeah, that's what this, uh, our, our relative here is asking about. What is the root cause yeah. of that? Yeah. And the whole, the whole world is colonized. Yeah. I think at, uh, if there's a number, I think at one point it exceeded like 86% of the earth. So that's where it comes from. And how every city in this world, every province, every country, every nation, every state, government state, that's all been made in violence. And until we address and acknowledge that violence, we're not gonna move no. forward. And no. you know, like You're even right. this question about, like me, yeah, I know I want us to recognize each other as human beings, but there needs to be a lot of work to get mm -hmm. to that point. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally. And I do get irked sometimes when I hear white men say, I wish we could just all be human beings, and I'll say, well, is that a battle for today, or, or is, and I'll, sometimes yeah. I'll say something, sometimes I won't, but there needs to be, before we can say that, there yeah. needs to be a lot of work done, mm -hmm. yeah. and the first thing is to acknowledge colonialism okay. and to teach our children and one another what that really means, yes. and yeah. the violence and the uh, fear of letting go of that power, because mm -hmm. it, it's all about the land. It is all about the land mm -hmm. and the capitalism that goes with it. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have a question. I just wanted no. to say, no. just say, Thank just you. say the C word. I like that, Elder Miigwech. Sherry. That was awesome. Yes, Miigwech, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up, folks. Uh, because we are past time, and I know we could literally sit here for hours. I, I know we won't get to all the questions, but I know there are avenues that you can uh, also use to, to get these questions answered as well. I want to thank every single person here for attending. These panelists here, Aisha, Marie, and Mohammed, thank you for your time and your energy today. Thank you to all of the staff at the CMHR who uh, helped do this. Frank Digital. Event Pro, these amazing ASL interpreters, oh, yeah. Kevin Klein Woo! and Sandra Smith. Woo! Because I know I talk really fast. <laughs> I was like, slow down, Natalie, slow down. Um, so thank you, uh, Chandra, Elder Sherry. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness. Like, anyways, I, I could. I could go on and on and on. I just, I'm thankful for all of you for coming tonight. And if I could leave you with one thing is not only to forget our questions from earlier, mm -hmm. keep thinking about those, right? What's important to you about addressing racism and what are some of the things you can do? Okay, those two things. Keep thinking those things all the time. I know my earring is making a noise. I'm gonna just stop doing that. <laughs> but I would ask you to challenge bias in action when you see it, respectfully. Challenge bias in action when you see it, respectfully, okay? And one thing that's really important, don't hear to deny or disprove someone, listen to understand them. Yes. And with that, I bid you a good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight.